Cheers, guys. Epics911, welcome to the Elitist Geek and another VR news update video. Before I get into the news, and we're going to look at uh, PlayStation VR, we're also going to look at a one that's been around for a couple of months, but more details have come out called Star VR and how it kind of separates or will separate itself from, you know, Oculus Rift and HTC Vive. But before we dive into that, I just want to give you guys an idea of the kind of content you can expect this week. Uh, as you guys know, the kind of the whole Vive debacle, I was really close to getting that benchmarking stuff out. So I'm going to complete that. I need that HMD, Vive HMD, to finish some of the editing that I was doing. I'm going to throw that stuff out there. Hopefully my Rift arrives. I'm super stoked about that. Uh, ultimately, whether I enjoy it, dislike it, uh, some games are better. I'm going to share all of that with you. As usual, the good, the bad, the ugly. We'll get into all of that. Uh, I can't wait. So, a lot of game content this week. I'm going to continue to do the new stuff. Uh, so there are going to probably, I'm, I'm aiming for a video a day for this next week to kind of really make up for the events this week. And on some days I'll probably double it up. So I'll have a news video and bookend that with uh, a game-centric video. All right. So let's get into the news. So we're going to start with this Star VR device and how it kind of separates itself from Oculus and HTC. And the first way that it separates itself is it's not a consumer device. They are targeting commercial uh, enterprise. That's kind of their target market is as a commercial device, right? And it's also not going to be very game centric. And I've had discussions with a few of you guys about exactly that, that, you know, both me and yourselves were kind of disappointed with the VR cinema aspect of the Vive and the Rift, right? And whereas I've got no issue spending hours playing, right? I'd be hard pressed to, to sit through a movie, honestly, in, in cinema VR. It's not something I can put my thumb on. It's just not something that to date I've kind of enjoyed. And I'm going to go back to that and revisit that and kind of really figure out why I haven't enjoyed it. But with that said, Star VR is targeting exactly that. They want to have some kind of crossover with IMAX. They want to do interactive movies and they want to focus on interactive content. Sounds cool to me. But what really hardware wise, what makes them different? Well, for starters, resolution. They're basically double on the horizontal. So they're 5120 pixels, so 5120 pixels by 1440. So 5120 by 1440 versus the 2160 by 1200 that we have on the Vive and the Rift, right? They've also got, accompanying that, a massively larger field of view of 210 degrees versus the 110. So, uh, obviously paired with the horizontal resolution, that's going to be pretty crazy. So, uh, I think that's really going to help the movie content. And again, I couldn't put my thumb on why I haven't liked movies so far uh, on the Vive, but maybe that has something to do with it, right? Is that that resolution is really going to help. So it's designed primarily for high-end VR experiences, right? They're also working on their own proprietary room VR. And I know I haven't talked about room VR a lot with regards to the Rift, and most of that is because I don't have one. Let's not kid ourselves and, you know, just blanket statement and say, you know, Vive has room VR, Rift doesn't, Rift sucks, because that's not the case. Rift can do room VR, and there's a really cool video that I'm going to actually link in the description where a guy's doing exactly that, with one tracker only playing some kind of third-person RTS game. He's crawling along the ground, he's, you know, walking around the perimeter, he even crawls diagonally along the ground to the base of the tripod motion tracker, and he stays in sync that whole time. Is that an accurate video, is there any shenanigans going on there? I can't comment on that, but based on looks alone, it looks like the Rift Room VR, you know, is almost as capable, if not just as capable. But again, 
when I get the riff, it's one of those things I'm going to spend time testing, absolutely looking at that, and I'll let you guys know if that is the case. Okay. So, proprietary Room VR, they're also working on their own controller, which I think is cool. And we're going to talk about the controllers a little bit, but I'm going to save that for when we uh, look at the PlayStation VR news, right? They're also working on what's called low persistence, the Star VR guys. And what low persistence basically is, is the stuff responsible for motion blur and ultimately nausea, right? So, when you think of latency and high frame rate, low persistence kind of in that same conversation for uh, determining how the end user is going to react, right? And it's something that Rift and Vive both have. Star VR is still working on it, so that's going to be cool. Now, the other feature that I really like about this is, uh, as you guys know, for the Vive users, we've got that interpupillary distance dial, right? So and IPD is basically from the center of the pupil to the center of the next pupil, measured in, in millimeters, right? And it determines kind of your comfort with the lens. Um, what these guys are doing with Star VR is they're going to auto-configure that, like auto-calibrate. They're actually providing eye tracking, which, think about that for a second. So, what do we have with the Vive and the Rift when we play cockpit games? Because that's really ultimately where eye tracking is going to be superior and awesome and way more realistic. Think about it, you're in a mech based game, right? You're looking ahead, but you kind of want to glance without moving your head to your right and check out some heating controls of your mech. Maybe your mech's overheating, right? Currently with the Vive and the Rift, you've got to move your head to that panel. And for us Vive users, particularly in Elite Dangerous, you've got to center that view so that the text you know, isn't too fuzzy or blurry, right? Meaning if it's at the perimeter, it's a little blurry on the Vive. So what these guys are doing in Star VR is they're going to auto-calibrate that and provide eye tracking to do that. So you'll be able to do exactly that. Cockpit-based games, you're gonna be able to just move your eyes and have that tracking take place, which I think is just gonna kick immersion up a whole new notch. And I would not be surprised if the second gen of VR that's just going to be a standard feature. I, I, I'd be willing to lay money on it. I'm that confident that that's probably going to be the case, right? So while, and, and the reason I bring up Star VR is, you know, and you're probably wondering, yeah, why the hell are you bringing it up? It's not a consumer device. Why do we care? Well, think about what I said in, I believe it was a video last week when I talked about marketing for VR. When I said, Skeptical people just don't get it, right? If they haven't tried VR, they just don't get it. I don't care how, you know, educated they are in virtual reality, you have to try it before you have the right to be negative about it. In, in terms of it as an experience, right? You can be negative about all other kinds of things about it. It costs too much, whatever. But, and I think most of you will agree, like me, anybody in my private life who was negative about VR, whether that was family or friends, as soon as they tried it, they got it at some level, right? Um, and that's going to be the key with Star VR. It's going to be out there. It's going to help the marketing for VR across the board because people who try this, who like it, are going to say, you know what, I want some of that at home. How do I do that? Well. You do it through Samsung, Sony, HTC, or Oculus. <laughs> so for helping virtual reality for all of us, I think in that sense, Star VR is going to be awesome. And I can't wait to see what they do on the commercial front. So that brings us to PlayStation VR. And we already know PlayStation VR is probably going to be the most affordable entry-level virtual reality solution. That's pretty much a given. We know it's going to have probably, on average, more AAA titles after about a year than the PC ones will do. Like, forget about indie games for now. Think just big publisher, developer, AAA titles. I think that's a pretty fair statement, right? What about weaknesses? What are the weaknesses that I can kind of see with the PlayStation VR? Well, I think one of the weaknesses, and we were talking about controllers, is the controller. And 
there was an interesting article in Upload VR, which I'm going to link in the description below, where they talk about exactly that. They talk about the PS Move controller, controller and how they feel ultimately it's going to hold PlayStation VR back somewhat, right? They go on to say that, you know, the Vive and Rift controllers ultimately make the PlayStation 1 feel sluggish by comparison. So that is going to be interesting because, you know, I've chatted with a ton of people who have, you know, Vive controllers, uh, with their Vives obviously, uh, people who've tried the Oculus Touch, and to me it almost seems more like a Xbox 360 versus PS3 controller type argument. They're both good, right? They've both got strengths and weaknesses, but inherently they're both good. Um, even the most hardcore fanboy of one side or the other is probably going to grudgingly admit that while theirs is 1A, the competitor is 1B, right? In terms of feel, functionality, all that kind of stuff. What I think, based on that Upload VR article, what I think with the PlayStation is that it's not a 1C, it's a 2. It's inherently not as good. So we talked about, you know, the Rift guy being able to do his crawling across the forward tracking. We know with Vive, properly configured, it does an awesome job tracking. The Move, not so much. Uh, it requires a lot more calibrating is what they were saying. They were frequently losing tracking with the Move. And let's face it, it feels like you're holding a karaoke mic. So. What are you doing? Are you playing VR? Are you singing karaoke? Whereas with the Touch and the Vive controller, it doesn't matter, like on the Vive controller, what I see when I look down in game, whether it's a sword or a rifle, the way they've designed it with that trigger grip, it retains the immersion for me. Like, it's convincing. It's a sword? Yeah, it feels like a sword. Club? Feels like a club. Gun? Feels like a gun. With the Move, not so much. So that's going to be really, really interesting. And I say that as a PlayStation Move owner, right? I've got the Move, and I've never been all that impressed with it. So where are they going to go with that? That's going to be the interesting thing. So granted, it's a better entry level. It's probably going to have, initially at least, a better selection of AAA titles. But let's be real about what the weaknesses are. And that is definitely, as I see it currently, one of the weaknesses. Alright guys, that's it for this news update video. Like I said, lots of game stuff coming this week and of course more news. As always, time for the beer. Cheers.